to Behavioral Grooves. My name is Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. Behavioral Grooves is the podcast where we explore why we do what we do. To accomplish that, along with our mission to expand the community of people interested in behavioral science, we have long-form conversations with researchers, practitioners, authors, and every now and then, an accidental behavioral scientist. Tim and I are grateful that we get to have conversations with some of the greatest researchers in the fields of psychology, economics, neuroscience, and sociology, as well as some of the newest and most passionate academics in the field. And as much as we love a good dip into the cool waters of the behavioral psychology pool, every now and then, we've got to change things up a bit. In this case, we thought we'd look back into our ancient ancestors' behaviors to see if we might get some clues as to why we do what we do. And, and, and Tim, we get to talk about monkeys. Oh, we, we, we talk about primates and their behaviors, right? It's- monkeys, Tim. <laughs> and, and, and I'm super excited about that, not just because they're monkeys, but because my daughter might actually listen to this episode now. I think you're dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true. She finds us kind of boring. I don't understand why. Because she's a daughter and you're her dad. <laughs> and she's 10. Yeah, right. <laughs> Okay. Uh, In this episode, we are pleased to share our conversation with the incredibly cool Jessica Mayhew. Jessica teaches biological anthropology and primate culture and cognition at Central Washington University in Ellensburg, Washington. It's actually just a couple of hours drive from either Seattle or Portland, just in case you want to know. Um, And her undergrad and graduate degrees are from the University of Chicago in biology and anthropology, and her doctorate is in evolutionary psychology. On the surface, it looks like she's floated around a bit, but it's really part of her secret sauce. Right. Her real passion is the combination of these fields. She looks at the world through the eyes of someone with an interdisciplinary practice. We talk about this a bit because she reminded us of George Lowenstein and Roy Baumeister's definition of hedge fox, someone who knows a lot about one thing and a little bit about a lot of things. We also talked about reciprocity and context in primate communities, the same way we talk about them as if we were talking about humans. Just this time, we were talking about apes and chimps and Tim, monkeys. (laughs) Okay, right, 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 right. Okay, Uh, we also talked about how important it is for primates to play. Play is critical to growth, and Kurt and I believe that it's important for ideation, innovation, and even personal success. And we couldn't help spend some time on Jessica's focus on juvenile primates and how that breaks with the traditions of researching adult apes and chimps. It's sort of like the way so much of human behavioral science is focused on studies where the participants are from what we call weird countries, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. Tim and I agree that there's much to learn from people who are not weird. Are you talking about me? Not in this case, (laughs) but if you're asking me if you're weird. (laughs) All right. Okay. I I should just let a sleeping dog lie there. (laughs) (laughs) Um, what What I want to close with is this, that we really appreciate Jessica's conviviality in our conversation. Kurt and I are not sophisticated in our knowledge of primatology. And Jessica dealt with our naive questions with professionalism and warmth. And we just really appreciate that she gave us a wide berth on our questions. So thanks, Jessica. Yeah, thank you. And if we call them monkeys and they're really primates, I apologize. So with there we go. With that, listeners, we encourage you to sit back with a fine whoa, 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 of- whoa, whoa, Wait a minute. This whole sit back thing. We've been telling listeners to sit back while they listen for nearly 200 episodes. Do you really think that anybody is actually sitting down to listen to these episodes? Yeah, they're probably shoveling snow off their sidewalk or preparing dinner or mowing the lawn or something. Okay, so I can dream, right, that they're just putting all their focus in on us while they're sitting down and having a great, you know, something. Okay, uh, back to the transition. (laughs) (laughs) As I was saying before, before I was so rudely interrupted, (laughs) and it wasn't by just a monkey, it was by (laughs) you, Tim. It's by me. Right? All right, we encourage you to sit back, prepare a dinner, shovel your walk, whatever you're doing, but do it with a cup of primate reciprocity. Enjoy our conversation with Jessica Mayhew.
Jessica Mayhew, welcome to Behavioral Grooves. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, we're excited. We're absolutely excited. Kurt, do you want to get started with a speed round? All right. So, Jessica, do you prefer coffee or tea? Coffee. Oh, the, no. oh there are some wrong thoughts there. I sense some controversy there. <laughs> I, I sense a lot of conviction there for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, would you rather have dinner with your favorite sports star or favorite musician? Uh, my favorite sports star. Oh, oh all right. Okay. And make it, can we ask who that is? Um, I mean, I'm a huge fan of, you know, I'm a huge fan of Mia Hamm. I'm a huge fan of um, U.S. Uh, women's soccer. Um, I would love to sit down and talk to Scotty Pippen. Um, oh. Yeah. yeah Scotty so, Pippen. Okay. So, yeah. so the U.S. soccer, <laughs> Mia Hamm. I, I get it. But then it just like you flipped a 1990s basketball player. I like, mean, yeah. Chicago Bulls. And that was, that was their era. And they, yeah, did it real. Are, are you a Chicago native? Is that, is that. I'm not. Or? I'm, I'm no, I'm an actual, I'm actually from New Hampshire. Um, <laughs> okay. But, so this is getting more and more interesting. Yeah, <laughs> but, but <laughs> I went to um, I went to the University of Chicago, and so um, you know I spent five years in that city and just absolutely fell in love with everything there, yeah. their food, their culture, the Midwestern sort of attitude. So um, yeah, real big All fan. Right. All right, well there you go. That's uh, fantastic. Th- it'd be interesting to have have dinner with Mia Hamm and Scottie Pippen at the same time. I, th- I think I that think would so. Be, yeah, that would be fascinating. <laughs> All right. All right. That, would, that was great for a speed round question, by the yeah, way. Yeah, well, hey, hey, I'm sorry. We <laughs> dug in, and that's how we do this here. It doesn't always have to be speedy. We can talk more. <laughs> All right. Would you rather learn a new instrument or a new language? A new instrument. Oh, okay. Yeah. A- anyone um, come to mind? Yeah. So I would. Um, I played the piano. Um, I played it for a long time, and I picked up the clarinet while I was moving through elementary and high school. Um, But I'd actually really love to learn the cello. Um, Oh, wow. Yeah. What what is it about the cello? What, 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 what draws you to that? I think it's just, it's just so soulful. Um, It's just so full and rich. uh, And it really is, it's just a wonderful way of expressing emotion. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've really always been drawn to the string instruments, but Never had, I don't know, the the dexterity to do it. I don't, maybe I just need more practice. If you play clarinet, you've got both hands working. If you play piano, you've got both hands working independently. True, I but I don't know. Something about those strings that I just can't quite, you know? <laughs> wow. Wow. We'll have to talk about Pablo Casals and Yo-Yo Ma, and there's all mm-hmm. kinds of great uh, cellists to talk about later. Okay. Uh, last, this is now, we're going to end the speed round now. All right. So, <laughs> so no more speedy answers. Sure. Uh, do you, do you, Her answers were speedy, Tim. It was our <laughs> follow-ups that weren't speedy. So don't, there's no blame at all okay. on, on being a slow round as opposed to a speed round. Uh, do you think we learn more about humans by studying primates or do we learn more about primates by studying humans? Whoa. Um, (laughs) I think that we learn, I think that we learn a lot about humans. So I would say probably the former, um, that we learn more about humans than we do kind of vice versa. Um, I think there are a lot of things that we would like to be able to understand in ourselves, uh, that sometimes that just holding up sort of a, a mirror, um, doesn't always, you know, it's, it's, it's not always the best reflection. And so we kind of go looking for deeper for answers to the the whys and the hows and, you know, why am I acting this way? Why am, you know, why am I drawn to this particular thing? Um, so, yeah, but I, I think that there's a lot, um, yeah. you know, back and forth that we can, can learn um, for one another. So, so yeah. you do a lot of work with primates, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I do. Mm-hmm. So what got you interested in, in in that versus you know it, just what tell us a little bit about you know how you got interested in this what brought you to this field this area of research yeah it was um i mean it wasn't you know there wasn't a giant sign that said come be a primatologist and you know <laughs> career <laughs> no fair blimp, day no blimp going across the sky as you were yeah. gone. no okay um and i feel that that's kind of a similar story for a lot of anthropologists even though i wouldn't necessarily describe myself as i mean i dabble in anthropology um but I'm also, you know, my undergraduate degree was in biology. My master's was in, um, was in anthropology. My, 
uh, doctorate was in evolutionary psychology. And so I see myself sort of as this amalgamation of all of those different fields. Um, but, you know, it was a scenario that I set out with another dream. I wanted to be a doctor and um, I was sort of going down that path and was hitting roadblocks and was feeling sort of inadequate and wasn't as enthusiastic about the work. And I just ended up in a class on primate social behavior and was like, what is this? And (laughs) can I do this for a job? (laughs) And it turns out that you can. And, you know, I, I had, you know, read, you know, read books when I was younger about Jane Goodall and Diane Fossey and Baruta Galdikas and was sort of tapped into that uh, aspect of science, but really didn't have an idea about how I would ever get there. Uh, And so it just so happened that I stumbled upon anthropology and um, the, the rest is sort of history. I'm trying to carve out, you know, a path. Um, it's not always easy, but. So you get inspired and, and you start down this, uh, this, this path. Uh, but it sounds like it hasn't been a direct, uh, with all these sort of side interests you have, it, it doesn't sound like you've been incredibly super focused, right, on just one thing. What uh, I, I'm just kind of curious. I, I'm not exactly sure how to ask this, but why? Why not just study one thing? <laughs> why, why? Why all these? Uh, you know, evolutionary psychology, anthropology. I, I see them as complementary, but mm-hmm. but in some ways, primatology is its own distinct uh, discipline. I, I think that we often see it that way. It is firmly under the umbrella of biological anthropology, which is one of the four subfields in in anthro. And, um, you know, I just have never been, I just have never, I'm easily distracted by, you know, (laughs) this thing, that thing over there. And I just find so many aspects of science and so many of the different disciplines um, to be really interesting and whether or not it, you know, it's within my wheelhouse or not, I, I do, um, really see sort of that value in having them come together, having scientists talk to one another and, and, you know, that interdisciplinary focus, I think is really critical to advancing some of those, you know, big questions that we're asking about human evolution that we're asking about, you know, why I do what I do. Um, and, and that I think that they're best sort of tackled from, you know, multiple, multiple fields coming together to offer their pers- perspective. Yeah. So we first found out about you, uh, became aware of some of your research through an article in the New York uh, is it Times. The New York Times. Excuse me. I just wanted where the wild things play. Uh, Eric Vance wrote that, uh, mm-hmm. which was fascinating because it was an article about you know play from all sorts of different animals, from canines to gorillas. Uh, and one of the things they talk about there is that uh, uh, from your research was looking at how gorillas play tag. Um, uh, can you get, tell a little bit for our listeners just about that and what, what was some of the, the insight that you saw from, from how gorillas play tag? Sure. So, uh, you know, Eric, uh, really, he really loved that when we were, we started talking about it, it kind of you know, blew his mind a little bit and that they actually do that. They construct games and, you know, this is how they engage with one another. Um, and they do, it looks very similar to, you know, children that are running around on the playground and, um, they, take turns. There's a lot of reciprocity there. Um, It's just sort of this back and forth that's full of energy. Uh, And so I think sort of the big takeaway from looking at it from sort of the human perspective is this idea of reciprocity. It's this idea that, you know, play is something that is mutual between partners. It's something that you want your partner to be really excited about and really willing to engage with you. Um, and without kind of that piece, uh, you lose, you, you lose it. Right. So the, the, the whole interaction sort of, you know, dissolves a little bit. Um, so it's just, you know, it's, it, there's that similarity there. Um, yep. But, you know, at the same time, it's, I mean, it's a bunch of gorillas that are running after one another. So it's. <laughs> well, you, you described it in the article that you were, you were uh, actually observing the, the baby gorillas at the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so is this something that is, is play with primates 
similar to the way play is with uh, with humans, in that it's mostly confined to the younger ones, to the to the less mature. Like like once once a gorilla reaches maturity, do they stop playing? Is there no more tag in their life? Um, I think if you're talking about sort of a happy. A happy gorilla. Um, if, uh, <laughs> you know, there, <laughs> there's, um, I mean, the, the idea is that once, um, once you kind of hit a certain age past, um, juvenilehood that you do see play taper off. Mm-hmm. Okay. This does, this doesn't, um, this isn't reflected in all primate species. It's not reflected in all, you know, species that play. Um, there are plenty of examples of like bonobos, for instance, who uh, will continue to play well into adulthood. Mm-hmm. And I think it really just sort of depends on the the adult society, right? Social society that they're living in. And so if they are um, a society that is increasingly tolerant, um, if they uh, find themselves sort of having these really intense adult relationships, um, they might continue to play. It really sort of is a species specific um, behavior, right? It's going to depend on their patterns of behavior as adults and whether or not they continue to play into adulthood. Well, it, it sounds like context matters to some degree in this, right? That mm-hmm. you talk about the social dynamics within the social and societal uh, aspects of this, uh, th- that there is a contextual aspect to, to uh, the rules uh, r- r- about how long you can play and what's going to be acceptable basically? Yeah. So I would, yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Um, I think that the type of primate society that you live in dictates the, the play style that you engage in. And so if you live in a primate group that is more cooperative, the play tends to reflect that. Um, same thing with if you live in a society that's a little bit more competitive, um, you see a lot more sort of rough and tumble play that's happening between juveniles. Um, and so it, there really is this um, conversation, right, that's happening between, you know, what's happening in juvenilehood and then what's happening in adulthood. Um, and so how, you know, play manifests in juveniles in a particular primate species is often reflective of what kinds of adult relationships they go on to have. And they often choose partners that, you know, um, are going to be individuals that they're going to encounter regularly as adults. Huh. Yeah, tell us about this. This is interesting because you referenced the healthy or the 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 um, what did you say uh, the good you know sort of the happy gorillas, right? You know, so uh, what what are the circumstances or the environmental things, the contextual things that lead to from happy childhoods into happy adulthoods? Sure. Well, I think that, you know, um, Gordon Burghart uh, is a prominent researcher in this field, and he laid out a couple of criteria that would be helpful for play researchers to identify what they're looking at as play. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of those criteria is that it has to occur in what we call a relaxed field. Um, And so that means that they, the individuals need to be sort of free from physical, social stressors. Um, So that could be, you know, um, they are satiated, so they're not hungry, they're not thirsty, they're not really experiencing too many, um, you know, social pressures from group members, Um, they're feeling sort of a low level of anxiety. And so this kind of creates that context for which play then emerges. Tell us a little bit about some of the research that you've been doing recently. What what are some of the things that have been uh, top of, of mind and interest that you're studying right now? So I am really interested in just determining what juveniles are doing with their day to day. I think that historically we in primatology, we have sort of pushed juveniles to the side and we say, okay, this is a stage of life um, that they have to get to and, and, you know, and they then become adults. And now they're doing all of the interesting things that we want to take, you know, data on. Um, And I think that, you know, missing this really formative period is, has been a disservice to the field in that there's some really interesting stuff that's happening there that we don't understand. And we kind of gloss over and, I think that it deserves a much more sort of nuanced, you know, look. And um, some of the work that I'm currently doing now with students, uh, we're focusing on that 
you know, that specific period and we're saying, okay, which juveniles are associating with which other juveniles? Are they creating their own sort of social networks amongst one another? And then thinking about how those early sort of friendships that emerge um, in juveniles, how they translate into adulthood and whether or not it kind of gives them a leg up in adult society. Is there an emotional component? I, you know, uh, Friends Duvall's uh, Mama's Last Hug certainly makes a case for uh, gorillas having, uh, apes having emotions, uh, that I- emotions are a, a, a visible part of their, of their life. Uh, do you think that emotion plays a role in uh, the, the development of these networks and uh, these relationships? Absolutely. Um, I think that it's an, uh, it's a component that we can't ignore any longer. I think that for a long, a long time in, you know, the scientific history, we've sort of put it aside as something that was not easily measurable, something that we can't easily sort of see. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that we've come to understand that it is a very big factor that drives motivation to participate in, in meaningful ways in your group. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that book um, by Franz de Waal, you know, is is a great way for sort of the general public, I think, to connect with um, chimpanzees, especially, right? They see things that are reflected in chimpanzees that, um, you know, Fran- Franz has a, a great way of being able to draw that reader in and, and make them feel like they're there and that they've also experienced, you know, those similar emotions. And so in terms of play, I think that... Um, yeah, it's it's a huge driver in whether or not an individual participates in, in a play bout or not. So one of the things from a play perspective, uh, you talked a little bit about this too, uh, Just re- it's just this idea of re- reciprocity, right? So, you know, all right, I, I tag you, you tag me, different things. So what else are you finding um, from some of the play aspects of uh, you, you know, and, 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 and are you studying, again, you're studying a variety of different primates. Right? It's not just gorillas. So help us understand a little bit about what you're, you're seeing with some of that stuff. Sure. So, um, so I study gorillas and chimpanzees and then uh, macaques. There are 23 different macaque species. Uh, <laughs> okay. They, they are, are all sorts of ways of being a macaque. And so we kind of put them on this four grade scale from super despotic, super aggressive uh, to being really cooperative. Um, And what you actually sort of see is, you know, things like reciprocity, um, turn taking, um, those, those types of behaviors actually change depending on, you know, how despotic of a species you are in terms of macaques. Uh So um, it kind of maps onto this idea of being you're either really cooperative, or you're really, you know, competitive. So I think in addition to reciprocity, some other things that are really interesting is, is just kind of looking at those, those things like play styles, mm-hmm. um, whether you're cooperative or competitive. Um, but then also, you know, looking at things like self-handicapping. So do you um, always choose to pick a partner who is, you know, evenly matched in physical, social, emotional skill? Or do you uh, have a variety of different play partners? Um, and so... Uh, and, and do you sort of uh, attune your behaviors to that of the smaller individual or the less experienced individual? And what you do find that across different primate species is that they're very well in tune to what their partner is experiencing um, oh. and whether or not their partner wants to kind of continue, you know, along in that play bout. And so there really is this intense communication uh, that's happening between individuals in a play bout that we don't really know very much about. Um, and, and so that's sort of a motivating factor for me is trying to parse out what is actually happening in a play about and how are they using sort of these nonverbal communicative um, cues to say back and forth to one another, like, this is a little bit too rough. Maybe I have to kind of attenuate my behavior. Um, this is okay. And I'm completely tolerating this. Okay. now it's my turn, you know? And so those, those types of really intimate um, social exchanges. Can, can you give an example of what that might, uh, so for our listeners who are not uh, familiar with a, a play bout uh, and, and maybe pick, I don't care, you know, McKay, uh, McCock, I can mispronounce that. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and what that looks like, what, what would a play bout look like? And what does, what does uh, that like communication feel like? 
Sure. So um, I'll just pick macaques um, because uh, they're just, they're absolutely fascinating to watch. Um, they will play dyadically, um, meaning that they'll play with just another partner, one singular other partner. Um, but they also will play polyadically. So then all of a sudden you will get like eight or nine of the juveniles in this big sort of monkey ball um, <laughs> rolling around and biting and, you know, sort of this, this rough housing that happens and it's sort of this careful kind of uh, orchestration of facial expressions. And so macaques have expressive eyebrows that they're raising um, up and down. They'll close their eyes and they'll kind of play like a blind man's bluff sort of game with their partners. Um, so it's like this idea of sort of trust. They uh, regularly make play faces. So they have this sort of slack jaw, open mouth. Um, it's just this, this outward signal that what they're engaging in, they're really happy to be engaging in. Um, and so it's just, you know, through these sort of communicative channels um, that they're able to kind of keep, you know, keep that uh, play bout rolling. And they will, you know, you'll have one partner who will jump in, another who will jump out. And so it's really kind of this revolving door of individuals, um, which makes it impossible to study, right? Um, <laughs> But so exciting. And they, they just really look like they're having this, you know, this great time. And um, sometimes they make mistakes. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of punishment for making those mistakes. But for the most oh. part, it's really this sort of learning process for them. They're, they're figuring out who they are, what they're capable of. Um, and then also what their partners are, are sort of thinking, feeling and how they're sort of responding. So it's this really delicate dance back and forth. With these macaques, are these games, uh, these playbouts, general gender neutral, or, or, or is there is there some some aspect of gender that 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 plays a role in this as well? So it um, again, it depends on right. So with the macaques in particular, you'll see males um, who will come together and they're sort of testing one another uh, to see who's stronger, who's bigger, who kind of has an edge, a competitive edge. Um, you'll see males and females also come together. Um, and, and that's sort of reflective of the partners that they're going to see later on in life, right? Um, in terms of mating opportunities. Um, and then, you know, females in macaque society are really strongly bonded, especially if you're related to one another. Mm. So you'll see females who are part of the same matra line spend a lot of time with one another, play a lot with one another. And it really is sort of shoring up those uh, kinship bonds between them. Um, so it really just, again, it sort of depends on what adult society in that species looks like. Well, I, I'm curious about, you You mentioned Fosse and Goodall and these fantastic researchers uh, in the past. And a lot, you know, we we've come to know them for a lot of the work that they've done in the field. And mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm wondering um, about what it's like as a researcher dealing with uh, created environments, you know, contained environments compared to, um, the, the, the wild, you know, and, and do you, you know, what, what you can learn from, from those different situations? Do you feel like there are certain limitations? I, I guess there's limitations with both, but, but how do you deal with those? I suppose it might be the better question. How do you deal with them? Yeah. So I think that it's about, you know, providing the context, especially if we're talking about like published research, providing that context of whether we're looking at a captive or a, a semi wild or a fully, I'm reluctant to say fully wild environment because I think <laughs> everything right is, you know, the, under anthropogenic pressure at this point. Um, but, you know, for some of the habituated wild groups like Jane Goodall studying or, you know, Fossey or Galdikas are studying, um, those are, you know, those are individuals who encounter humans, you know, every now and then, um, local communities of people. They also have these annoying researchers who sort of follow them and track their <laughs> behavior every single day. But in, to some degree, they have sort of the space, the freedom to kind of go about their, what we would consider to be their natural lives. Um, the captive environment is a little bit different. You're taking away some of those um, external environmental pressures that can, you know, be really problematic for you in, in terms of survival, um, in terms of sustenance. Um, and so the captive environment kind of induces sort of this ability actually to play with a little bit more freedom because some of those other needs are already being met, um, mm. whether you're being provisioned 
regularly, whether you have a safe space that you know that you're going to be able to bed down every single night without, you know, having to deal with predators. So it's sort of a trade-off and it kind of comes out and um, in our published work as, you know, take this with a grain of salt. This is a captive environment, right? But I do think that it allows researchers to be able to look at play in a, in a much more sort of nuanced way, because with the captive environment, you don't have to worry about obstructions in the field. You don't have to worry about trekking for long periods of time to see individuals. Um, and so they're just sort of there, they're doing what they would normally do on a day-to-day basis. And we can really tackle behavior from this really kind of narrow, sort of narrow perspective. It sounds like you even get uh, there might be more play, like like this idea of a Maslow's hierarchy thing that wants food and shelter and and I don't have to worry about predators is taken away, that it might actually encourage or it, it at least allow for more play, right? And, and so that's got to be a good thing uh, in the captive environments. So it has been suggested in the research that we can use uh, playfulness as a behavioral indicator of welfare, of, of well-being of those individuals in captivity, which is a really interesting way of looking at it. So if these other needs are being met and they have all of a sudden this free time to interact with one another and um, you know engage in these fun, um, energetically expensive ways right, that are not costly to them. Um, then that's a a good indicator that this is a well-cared-for group. So, yeah, it has been suggested kind of using that uh, Maslow's paradigm. (laughs) Well, we we look at that in humans, right? You know, the Mm -hmm. the, the person who has the ability to learn how to uh, play croquet really, really well is probably doing fine on all of the basic, you know, financial and food and social things, right? If they become a masterful croquet player, that, that level of esotericism is probably because they everything else is being taken care of for them for sure yes Cro- croquet first off, <laughs> I don't I'm know. sorry I, I I'm just I, I need to call out croquet <laughs> well, really I, I that, thought it was more exotic than tennis <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh I don't know <laughs> Uh, so you, you talked about these different McKay, uh, things being from a very dictatic to more collaborative piece. What, what are some of the differences that you see in play style then between those different types of societies that, that you see there? So in a more competitive society, you typically see a lot more um, aggressive behaviors or what we would characterize as being aggressive behaviors come into action. So there's a lot more biting. There's a lot more um, grappling and sort of slamming of one another down. But there also seems to be some degree of understanding that um, between the individuals that, you know, I'm not doing this to hurt you. Um, okay. This isn't happening in an aggressive sort of context. This is, you know, um, this is all in, in good fun. Um, and and it's been suggested that that's actually a great way to uh, practice, right? Those types of behaviors that uh, inevitably in your adult life, when you're, when you find yourself in, especially for males and you find yourself in a competitive situation with other males that you, you're going to have to be able to bite effectively, grapple effectively, move very quickly and, and get out of the way. Um, and so it's really kind of this arena of, of, of practice. And you, you can see sometimes that there's a little bit of a, a skew, right? So You'll have certain individuals who really are not that interested in self-handicapping, you know, all the time. And and, and so you will see uh, lots of play bouts kind of devolve into aggression, right? So okay. there's not, it's just sort of this, you know, it's just we're, we're practicing, we're practicing, we're practicing. I don't care that you want to take a turn now. I'm still going, I'm still going. Um, and, and so really it just kind of right, depends on, you know, how competitive or how competitive cooperative, you know, the species it is that we're talking about. How does why we do what we do? I mean, we think about it in human psychology. How does this apply to, uh, to primatology? Well, I think it's sort of that the human evolutionary piece, right? I, uh, there are many biological anthropologists, primatologists who study primates with the idea that we can kind of link their behavior Um to modern day humans, right? So they are evolutionary ancestors. And if we can sort of figure out why they are behaving the way that they are, then maybe there's some sort of explanation offered there for why we do what we do, um, some sort of, you know, corollary. 
Um, it doesn't always map on, right? Yeah. But yeah. Um, I, I do think that's kind of a, a big sort of, of driver. And I know that that's one of the reasons why I got really interested in, you know, animal behavior in general is just sort of this idea that we're not isolates from the natural system. We're part of this, you know, this part of this large ecosystem um, and that we need to be able to work in concert with it. We don't sit outside of it. And to better understand ourselves, why we think the way that we do, why we engage with others um, in these really particular social ways, um, you know, all of that is sort of rooted back uh, for me and, you know, why, what is, what are, what's the basis of behavior in general across the animal kingdom? So um, those have always been sort of motivating factors for me. And I know that they are for a lot of other primatologists as well. Well, and I'm glad that you're taking it uh, to, to look at the juveniles. I think that it's really cool. It's sort of like all of the studies that were, so many studies that have been done in, in human psychology have been focused on, but well, they've been administered to college students, you know, which are you know, basically, you know, uh, up, upper middle class, uh, you know, students that, uh, again, don't really have to worry about sustenance or being eaten by predators or, <laughs> or you know, where am I going to get my next meal? And so, uh, so now the, the fields of social science and behavioral science are extra- expanding and saying, well, what is it like if, if you don't have a lot of money? What if, what if you're in a socioeconomic environment that's, that's more challenging? Uh, and so I, th- I, it, there, to me, it feels like there's a corollary to what you're doing to expand the, the 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 literature really into more interesting and more nuanced uh, stories to tell. Is that is that a fair correlation to make? Uh, it sounds great to me. I mean, yeah, of course, <laughs> my work described like that. Um, I, I do. I think that it's really important to you're you're right about you know psychology and that we focus on this very homogenous group of participants that have yeah. a particular way of viewing the world and um that's that's not our reality um which is you know i have some wonderful colleagues in cultural anthropology who are studying you know all sorts of different populations of people that are not kind of that classic sort of white you know upper class you know uh, US college based educated western US, european yeah, yeah western us european. yeah yeah Exactly. So um, I do. I think that that's really important. And I think, too, that, you know, in the, in the study of play, and for those who do study human play in particular, there has been this expansion outside of kind of that Western global north uh, sort of look at things um, to, you know, hunter gatherer populations and sort mm-hmm. of thinking about play in, in ancient uh, groups and ancient cultures as well that has really added to that rich tap- tapestry of sort of literature that's available. So uh, you may not be able to answer this, but but do you see the the correlation you talk about because you're studying play in primates? Um, so h- how does that correlate then to play in in human kids? You know, uh, uh, do you see are there are there similarities? Are there things that you that 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 people are doing that you go, yep, this translates right into what we're seeing with with these primates that we're doing? I think you see this progression of, you know, starting out sort of simple. Um, you do a lot of back and forth with mom. She's yeah. a primary caretaker. Um, and then you sort of slowly branch out. Um, so there's a lot of sort of solitary play that emerges first, object play that emerges, and then you move into sort of the social realm and then you ratchet up in sort of complexity. Um, and, and it's similar for, for primates, or for non-human primates and, and for humans. Um, so kind of that develop those developmental milestones. Yeah. But I mean, you know, we, we talked a little bit about just sort of games that are played um, and sort of this mutual social contract that you're engaging, um, that you're right, you're, you're entering in with another partner uh, that, okay, well, now it's my turn, right? And so those types of, um, I think, ideals are important in both, right? non-human primates and, and human primates. So there are, there's, there's quite a bit of overlap. I wouldn't say that it's sort of like this one-to-one, right? We see this in non-human primates, we see this in humans, but there's certainly a lot of, uh, a lot of similarities, a lot of commonalities. So my 14 year old son, who is now, you know, like just holds himself up in his room and just plays with his kid or his friends. They have the same teenage kind of thing going on with, uh, with, uh, with the non-human primates that you study. Yeah. So as uh, they get older, they, you know, they start sort of getting into these little cliques, um, these, you know, these sort of friendships that have developed over the years. 
Um, again, it depends on whether you're male or female and uh, whether or not you're supposed to be the, the sex that disperses from your primate group or if you get to stay. But yeah, yeah, it just, I mean, it's, it's sort of this increasing complexity. And so studying, yeah. you know, a three-year-old in, in non-human primate terms is, you know, similar to that idea of you're, you're looking at teenagers, right? Yeah. Um, versus if you're studying this really, you know, one month old newborn, um, they don't really know what they're doing at. They're trying to figure out their body and how it moves and physics and things like that. And um, their mom is being really restrictive of yeah. you know, them moving. And <laughs> so, yeah, there are there are a lot of sort of, you know, common threads between the two. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, I uh, c- can, we, can we talk a little bit about music? <laughs> I've been holding off, Kurt. I've been, I I've know been, you have. That's a, that's a thank you, Tim. All right. So, so I'd like to start our musical discussion with with a question that do you know of uh, any impact that music has on the primates that you're working with? So there have been a couple of studies that have focused on whether sort of, you know, um, discordant music has an impact if, you know, they like it or they don't like it. Um, there has been this idea that maybe maybe if we pump in sort of ambient noise or sort of I don't know, elevator music into a captive setting that it might, you know, reduce anxiety or improve welfare, you know, things like that. And there's not a whole lot of strong evidence for that being the case. Um, We do know that, you know, chimpanzees especially do not like sort of this kind of chaotic noise when it's sort of pumped into their environment. But uh, we have, there's been some really interesting work that has focused on rhythm in okay. chimpanzees and so this idea that you know maybe our kind of you know evolutionary origins for being able to feel a beat has you know much deeper roots than we thought it did um cool. so it extends even to yeah our non-human primate ancestors so chimps regularly drum on um things in their environment uh so if you're in a captive setting it can be big barrels um big pieces of enrichment the walls, the floors, but in the wild, it's usually buttress roots. So these really big trees, um, they'll, you know, sort of kind of create their own, you know, their own rhythm, right. Which is again, a communicative thing. Um, they're communicating to others that I'm, you know, I'm big, this is, this is how I'm feeling right now. Um, and, and everybody sort of pays attention to that in the group. Is, is that part of the play that, that, the like the the younger do or is that more of something as you said it's that my i'm a dominant and so i'm i'm making this noise that a, any thought on that they well so you will if you go and just watch an, an ape group and watch a bunch of juveniles they do sort of practice these things and so it is it does become part of play so especially part of like object play so if they have yep. this really um really big kind of barrel it's hollow they'll sort of bang on that they'll kind of listen, stop, try out different beats, try out, you know, their hands, their feet, degrees of intensity. And so it does seem that they're kind of practicing, right, again, for this adult state in which it, you know, is in a different context, it takes on a different communicative purpose. So it, it's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah. There's, yeah, it's just, an, it's an incredible um, kind of track in our field, to sort of study, you know, um, music and rhythm. Well, I would just, I would just like to see, you know, on a barrow with the feet and, and the hands going. I, I, I would think that would be fascinating just to watch, just from a personal perspective. It's got to be bigger and broader than humans. You know, where the birds respond to songs. There's dogs that like to sing, so to speak. You know, I, my gosh, I, I would think of it to be a natural connection. Intuitively, mm-hmm. I would imagine it's a natural connection to primates. Um, but let's turn to uh, to human primates and let's uh, ask you about your playlist. <laughs> what are you listening to these days? What What is important musically to you? With the background that you have, I would I, I could imagine you know classical music is you know is pretty important. Yeah, I do. Um, so it depends on what I'm doing. Um, so if I'm writing, um, I usually have something classical on in the background. Then that might be Yo Yo Ma. Um, often uh, it's sort of these intense kind of soundtracks. Um, so I really love like the you know the um, Planet Earth 2 soundtrack and kind of these really sort of big orchestral pieces that make me feel like I'm, you know, contributing something and as in my writing and 
Um, but you know, if it's sort of reading or if it's just, you know, answering emails or doing kind of, you know, those other day-to-day tasks, um, it really varies. I love all types of music. I range all the way, you know, I range from rap all the way to really sort of cheesy, embarrassing pop music. It kind of just depends (laughs) on, you know, whatever my mood is for that day or whatever mood I'm trying to sort of generate. Um, So do you use it as a prompt or a prime to kind of say, this is the mood that I want to have, or this is the mood that, is it thoughtful, intentional in that way? It is. Um, It's if I'm, you know, I I really have to sort of psych myself up for something. I try to put on something that I know that I've listened to in the past that kind of motivates me and gets the heart rate going a little bit and gets me excited, Uh, which is why, right? So like when I'm writing and my brain is supposed to be focused and elsewhere, things like classical music and that sort of soothing background um, noise is a lot lot better of a fit for me. That's wild. I've... Uh, I have a hard time thinking about classical as just being soothing uh, mm. <laughs> because it, it just engages me so much. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, I know, Tim. We've had I'm this just, conversation before. Exactly. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I, 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 most I, most normal human beings. You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, yeah, that's right. So you do have uh, different kinds of music that you like for different tasks. Um, and, uh, if you're doing really engage, you, you said you were, when you were writing, you might want to listen to say Yo-Yo Ma, but what, and is this in the sort of the most intense kind of creation when you're, when you're writing something from scratch and you need really heavy thought process, could you still be having some Yo-Yo Ma in the background? When I'm stuck and I need to really get a thought out and I'm having a really hard time of, okay, I know what I want to say, but I, I can't quite unstick it. Um, I have to have silence. Um, I, yeah, I just, I have to turn everything off, take a few moments and just sit and sort of, you know, do a brain dump onto the page and then I can, you know, reintroduce music back in. Um, because what I, I I feel like it, I feel like it often distracts me and then I'll, you know, I'll start, you know, thinking about the background music and then I'm like, oh no, I'm supposed to be doing this. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, you know, have this thought I'm trying to be profound. Um, and (laughs) it's not happening in the presence of this other genius over here. So, um, I kind of have to, I kind of have to shut everything out and, and operate that way. Um, so yeah, I think it depends on sort of how far along in the writing process I'm, I'm in. Um, and whether or not I'm like revising or something is actually coming straight from scratch for me. Yeah. Wow. Wow. It almost sounds like you have sort of a rubric, you know, that uh, a guide that says, okay, let's see, I'm going to be editing. So I need this kind of soundtrack. (laughs) to go with it. I do. It just, it's, it's really interesting. So, you know, my students will walk into the office and they'll like, I'll have Spotify playing in the background and, um, it's, it can be, it can be literally anything. It just depends on the task that I'm doing. I'm like, okay, I got to switch to, you know, like Kendrick Lamar. Okay. We're really we're <laughs> moving forward in this day. I'm going to check things off my to-do list. So yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's fantastic. Jessica, thank you so much for, for being on the show. We appreciate it. And the insights are, are fantastic. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our conversation with Jessica, have a free flowing conversation, and we talk about whatever else comes into our monkey brains, Tim, (laughs) monkey brains. I'm reminded of Clue, the the movie Clue. Oh, the movie? I thought you were going to talk about the board game. No, no. Monkey brains, while common in Cantonese cuisine, is not (laughs) common in parts of New Jersey. (laughs) You know, I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever seen the movie because I don't remember that line. So, but that is a good line. Oh, man. It was just, the cast was fantastic. It was just great. Okay. But where should we start grooving? Let, let's, let's get back to the topic here. Well, we shouldn't go over to Cantonese because our brains might be eaten. But, um, <laughs> well, we're not monkeys. So I don't think we have to worry about it. Well, we have monkey brains, though. <laughs> yeah, definitely today. Definitely. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. So, um, I, I don't know. I mean, one of the things that was so, interesting about Jessica is that she is, as we talked about in the intro, right? She's this hedge fox. Oh, she yeah. has this background and interests that cross a number of different disciplines. And 
I just find that fascinating. I love people who do that. I think there's some real value in having that cross disciplinary focus. Right, right. Like the the she's trained in evolutionary psychology, right? That's that's the she's got the evolutionary explanations for why we do what we do. That's the mm-hmm. fox part. But her hedgehog part is that she wants to integrate all this interdisciplinary work to inform her, right? And she likes to work with people that are are interested in this interdisciplinary stuff. And, and of course you and I were inspired by the way Carnegie Mellon approaches this yeah. with, with their decision sciences group, because it's very interdisciplinary and we love that, you know, we're, we're inspired by that kind of interdisciplinary work and think that there should be more of it. Yeah. So I think there's some really interesting pieces about this because she talks about, you know, things being in or beyond her wheelhouse and broadening that scope. And I think that, you know, and, and, and I don't know if this is a, direct correlation into, you know, regular, uh, what we do on a regular basis, but the more that we can broaden the scope of what we do. And so I love this as this being a, a, one of the episodes that we have for behavioral grooves, because we're bringing in a different perspective. And I think having that moving beyond kind of the standard psychologists, sociologists that we bring on board, the the behavioral scientists, behavioral economics uh, uh, focus that we have, I think by bringing in somebody who is a primatologist or some different element provides a greater opportunity to open our eyes to new ideas and to get our thoughts, our monkey brains thinking in different patterns, right? Yeah. Well, we're, we're going to host uh, Bill Von Hippel here shortly, uh, evolutionary psychologist, and we're going to have more on that. So, I, and, and I absolutely feel that way. I think it's fantastic that we, we do. I get a new perspective, right? When, when we talk to people like this and Jessica was fantastic in that regard. I also want to talk about context matters, right? You this, love context matters. God, it's like, man, I don't know why it's just so important to me, but I just, <laughs> it is. We need to make t-shirts, There's some context matter t-shirts with the behavioral grooves, you know, logo, and we just need to wear those everywhere. Well, I, and then we change the whole world because we've so many of the decisions that we make are based. We can on- change the world with context matter t-shirts. There we go. I kind of love that actually. I mean, it's, it's our accomplice, right? Context is just our accomplice in nearly all of our behaviors. So if, Context is our accomplice in all these behaviors, right? That we've got, we've got leaders who are setting the tone for either a cooperative or a competitive environment, right? What does that say about where, where we're at right now in our society? Exactly. When we think about the leader that we have in place right now, um, from a president uh, on down through you know, the, the people in Congress, but I think that's one part of our society and, and and obviously, we have a big um, where this is a, a week and a half out from the, you know, the 2020 election. And so there's going to be a big kind of referendum on this. But I don't know if people understand how much that that mimicking happens. And so what that lends itself into the type of society that we have. So what we see at the top and how that gets transmitted down through the different people that work for um, whoever that leader is. And then that just gets transmitted down. It's this cascade effect. Right. And it does. And do, and, and do we understand the implications of what that has on the rest of society? And so what type of society are we making when we have um, leaders who continually lie and who leaders who, you know, focus only on themselves and leaders who don't care about others who are different from them that have maybe are from a different quote unquote tribe that impacts, I think, an overarching ethos within the society. And I think that's important. And so, I mean, we try not to get too political on this, but, you know, it's one of those things I think that makes a difference. And I just don't think people realize that. It absolutely does. It, it, it also blends right into one of the things that I know, that I know that we wanted to talk about, which is reciprocity, right? Yeah. Cooperation and reciprocity. If we've got, if we have a world where the leaders are modeling a sense of reciprocity, if they're actually out there sort of demonstrating, oh, 
you did this for me. I'm going to do this for you. No. And, and do it in a sort of a natural, not a tit for tat kind of a thing, but in, in just a more organic manner, then guess what? I, I, I'm pretty sure that the rest of the world is, or at least of our society is going to follow along. Yeah. Well, and you think about this, so let's take this down to a more manageable, um, you know, unit as opposed to, you know, society as a whole. Think about your business. Think about the company that you work for or the department or yep. the team and think about what are the behaviors that the that that you, if you're a leader, what are the leaders that you are exhibiting, and are you exhibiting reciprocity? Are you exhibiting honesty? Are you exhibiting these things? Because that's what people are looking up to. That's what they are seeing. And if if we are anything like our our cousins in in the primate world, right? We realize that that context matters. That reciprocity happens naturally unless it's you know discounted and we just can we can use that we can understand that and so this these are the things that we need to be doing as leaders and even if you're not the formal leader within your organization you can be that that community leader within your company and the the person who people look up to as that is the de facto leader and so you need to do this stuff it reminds me, although it's not a perfect analog uh, for reciprocity, but when we talked to Michael Bowden from mm. Genta, and he said it's more, it's less about what did you get done when he went as a leader when he's talking to his team. It's less about what did you get done and more about how are you doing. Yeah, and I, and I love that idea. I love that approach because that lays a foundation where things like play can happen, where innovation can happen, because it's not a crack the whip kind of environment. It's really, let's, let's figure it out together. Yeah. It's a human centered environment, right? And we're, yeah. you, know, you think about what that means and particularly in this time, right? I mean, one of the things that, uh, you know, we learned from this episode is that, uh, you know, these primates needed a relaxed atmosphere for this to really happen. That when it was a stressed atmosphere, reciprocity didn't happen, play did not happen as much. And so when you think about that, you think about what's going on with COVID-19 and all of the stress that is underlying that. Uh, you know, one of the episodes we did, I think there was a study by the Census Bureau that's an ongoing spot analysis that they do, you know, every couple of weeks. Yep. And they found like one third of Americans are exhibiting, you know, psychological um, distress um, symptoms. And so one third of the people that are out there are having these really hard times. And now they might be hiding it. They may not be showing it. It may not be exhibited in the behavior that they have with you at work because as, as humans, we don't like to express our weaknesses and we don't like to, to do that, particularly when it comes to, you know, uh, psychological stress or mental kind of feelings where we're, we're feeling inadequate or just so stressed out that we don't know it. But understand that those people are in your workforce and that they're stressed. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They're there. Whether you like it or not, whether you acknowledge it or not, sound familiar? Um, it's there and it's, and it's troublesome and you've got to address it. You've got to be willing to, uh, to address it, which leads me into thinking about, uh, we are not, when Jessica said, we're not isolated from the natural system, mm. right? We are all in this together. The pandemic is a great example of something that is impacting everybody in the whole damn world, uh, on varying, in varying different degrees, right? Depending on where you are and depending on how well your, your country leaders have done, but, I just it just amazes me that humans are so good at acting like we're disconnected from the rest of the world. Right. And and I think one of the interesting pieces about that, not only just connected to the rest of the world, but um, you know, the generalization of some of the things that are going on. So to that degree, we often put ourselves into these tribes, right? We put ourselves into an us versus them, in-group versus out group. And this idea of you know, there's us as humans, and then there's there's them as monkeys, and then there's the environment as the environment, and we're all separate, yeah. is just this false kind of separation that, you know, we are all connected, and we're more alike in many ways, and, and more dependent upon each other Absolutely. than we, we tend to, to, to think about. And so I think that's a really important aspect as we move forward. 
And with that, I think that leads into this idea of weird that we talked about at the beginning, right? And that we we, we got to going is that one of the things that I think behavioral science in general is, is missing out on is that we we do tend to focus in on our studies and our research on weird countries, you know, Western educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. So that means that that by default, then are we are we really getting that full picture of everybody within that system, the entire population of the world? And are the findings we have transferable to them? Obviously, some of them are going to be, but there may be some that aren't, probably a lot that aren't. And so to understand that, I think we need to really look beyond our little weird world. For me, that's that's just a doubling down on context matters, right? <laughs> right? It's true. Like, it's like we've got to, we need to be study loss aversion in, you know, lots of different environments, uh, left, lots of different societies, you know, places where money is super important and places where money is less important. You know, let's, let's understand, you know, the impact of loss aversion in, in a variety of different cultural contexts. Yeah. Which is why, which is why one of the things that I'm really excited about that we recently joined and not for this to be a plug, but um, you know, we just, we, we were one of the founding members of Diversify which is this worldwide uh, conglomeration of independent um, behavioral science consultancies, which is the largest network of those a- across the globe. And we have um, partners in from Australia to Southeast Asia to Europe, uh, Africa. You know, we're looking to find some um, additional partners in, in Central and South America, some Eastern European countries that we don't necessarily have. Right. China. Um, but we are looking to expand that connectivity between, you know, what we know here being centered in the United States and what the, the breadth of knowledge that is out there in behavioral science from all these different places, right? Make sure that we're, we're tag teaming on those and that we're sharing the insights and the knowledge and bringing that to bear on whatever problems that we as a consultancy, you know, either behavioral alchemy or lantern group or behavioral grooves, um, what we're doing. I'm glad you brought up Diversify because it is, uh, it's a great organization. I just want to give a shout out to uh, Jez Groom for really leading the, the entire effort and the entire initiative out of Cowrie Consulting in London. He's yeah. uh, He's just done a, a fabulous job, and his passion is is needs uh, recognition. Um, I just want to say we don't typically groove on music. Generally. Not, we groove on music all the time. I think you just forget. Just, just not enough. Let me. <laughs> <laughs> but but when when Jessica was talking about uh, uh, so this is a little a little bit of a tangent, but she talked about how chimpanzees didn't like chaotic noise, right? Mm-hmm when it was pumped into their environment that it really kind of drove them crazy. And I thought, you know, in our workplaces, you were talking about work here and in our workplaces, there's oftentimes when in offices, there is music pumped in and it's usually kind of soothing. It it might be upbeat, but it's low key. It's not noisy, things like that. We're not all that different from chimpanzees when it comes to not feeling good about having chaotic music and chaos in general doesn't, it, of course, guess what? Goes back to play. It yeah. does, it doesn't encourage play. It doesn't encourage relaxation. It only enhances baseline anxiety. You know, we, we could do a lot to have to use music in a way that engages uh, a more soothing experience in our lives. Okay, so I want to explore this a little bit because um, the city of Minneapolis, uh, a number of years ago, in order to try to um, you know, have that we have these places where groups of youth congregated in downtown Minneapolis. Many of them were youth of color and they thought that they were scaring off um, tourists and tourists and business people and various different things. And so what the city of Minneapolis did was they piped in classical music, which I would not categorize as chaotic, um, and I don't know the results of this, but the the intent was that, you know, these kids are going to not not like this 
uh, classical music as, as it's being pumped in. And so thus they won't congregate together around these certain hubs. Well, I, I'm going to check into that. I want, I want, I'm going to have to, to dive into it and we'll put it in the show notes because that's such a cool idea because it's, it would be disruptive, right? It, it wouldn't be something that they're familiar with or that they love that might, you know, might be hip hop or, or rap or, or something like that. You know, this would be like, wait a minute, what, the, what is that sound? That classical music, that's icky. So is, is chaotic then? Is chaotic then just being different than the normal? Yeah, just being disruptive. Yeah. Right. So if if I if my familiarity is with, you know, aggressive rock or or rap and you play me Mozart, is that a chaotic component for my brain or is there some musical aspects that because again what I was thinking and in how Jessica was talking about this was it was just the discorded elements and, and you've talked about this and I I obviously don't have the musical background to know this but there are times where you you know there's a natural kind of flow from from chords that is a melodic kind of thing and if you change those up it creates this tension that is just a, a involuntary kind of re response. Is that correct? Right. It can that that disruption of of sort of the anticipated direction can be pleasing, or it can be disruptive. Okay. Um, it can be the kind of thing that that we like that little twist, but there's times when we was like, no, it doesn't belong there. So so with that, you know, again, we're talking businesses, right? And you're talking about pumping in kind of music kind of things into yeah. into into elevators and into the other pieces. What if they pumped in ministry? You know, <laughs> what if they popped in some really harsh kind of, you know, and, and you get people in there you, like, all right, their blood gets going. Maybe that's an energizer. Do, do we, I mean, has anybody done any studies on that? I don't know. Oh, no, I, I, I'm not aware of any studies. And that makes particularly me with ministry, right? <laughs> particularly with ministry and particularly with context, right? What yeah. about the demographics? Yeah. Uh, what about the the kinds of people that you're trying to stimulate? You know, what if you had a bunch of uh, what if you're in an art museum and you're trying and the and you've got you're trying to get the employees that are working in the art museum going? Do you think you might turn to hip hop or might you turn to Mozart? I don't know. That's an interesting conversation, and thus we groove on it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. I think we beat that. Uh, our, our monkey brains are just going way down in this uh, in, in this whirlpool of I don't know what. So with that, hang on because we'll have a bonus track right after this. Hey Groovers, this is Kurt with the bonus track and groove idea for our episode with the inspiring Jessica Mayhew. Jessica inspires us with her interdisciplinary focus and the way she's always looking for ways to cross into new fields. That's why we call her a hedge fox. She's super deep into primatology, but she also likes to dabble in anthropology and other disciplines as well. She reminded us about how important play is and the important role reciprocity has in the animal kingdom. She talked about context and environment and how primate communities that value cooperation with their juveniles end up with adults that cooperate. And the opposite is true as well. Highly competitive groups foster more competitive behaviors in their juveniles. Kind of gets you thinking about human communities, right? And in a related note, she reminded us that none of us are disconnected from the whole. We are all part of the same ecosystem and we can take a lesson from that. Okay, now it's time for your groove idea. This week, Tim and I would like you to give some consideration to being playful at work. We have had several guests on the episode who reinforce the importance of play and playfulness when it comes to innovation and ideation because it opens up our minds to new possibilities. So this week, if you've got a team meeting to attend virtually, consider adding a game to the agenda to open everyone's thinking up. Since we're still deep in the pandemic, we can't do this in person, but you could use a technique we learned about from our friend, Todd Fonseca. He asked people this, quote, if you could have any superpower for an hour, what would it be? Think about that and give it a try. 
let us know how it goes. We'd love to hear from you. We also want to thank you for listening, and we hope you'll leave us a quick rating or review before you go on to the next podcast. And finally, we hope that today you go out and find your group. Mm-hmm.